I don't know, Mateo, what do you tell people about that? Inspiration's got to come from within. Yeah. It's like watching a kid get beat up by bullies coming up to him and be like, you want to take like karate classes? He's like, nah. You're like, what the fuck more can I offer you here, kid? Is this, you like this? They're like, I don't mind it. This conversation with Dr. Mike is full of tons of golden nuggets for the guy who wants to lose body fat and build muscle using a simplified approach for people who want to get lean but don't have the bandwidth in their life to go all in and use some kind of complicated system. We also talk about how losing body fat and getting in shape can upgrade the quality of your life in a bunch of different aspects. You'll also want to stick around to hear Mike's unique and thought-provoking take on inspiration, something that kind of got the wheels turning for me about a newsletter I might write in the future. I think you'll love this one, so enjoy. All right, God Emperor Mike Isratel. I'm excited to pick your brain about how do people really get in shape when they don't have a ton of mental bandwidth for this stuff and, and maybe aren't really feeling super motivated for it. And one of the mm -hmm. things that I've found to be really motivating to help guys get into this stuff is thinking not just about, hey, how good am I going to look on the beach? How great are my abs going to look? But how much better is life going to be on the other side of this stuff? I know you went through a pretty awesome weight loss be, being kind of overweight yourself. And I did something similar and my life dramatically improved afterwards. And uh, this is something that I see with a lot of my guys who lose like 40, 50 upwards, you know, closer to a hundred pounds mm -hmm. is they go through this thing where life just gets so much better. One guy I worked with just bought a Harley, got promoted, like, you know, in got engaged to his long-term girlfriend. Oh, wow. It just seems like shit just gets better. So I'm curious what your take is on that. Why are guys upgrading their lives when they get in shape? And did you experience anything like that? And, and what do you think contributes to that? I have a bit of a unique um, experience with this myself because I, I purposefully got out of shape. <laughs> I was trying to super bulk for, for getting big. And so when I debulked and I lost a lot of fat, yeah, things definitely got better. There's a couple of ways in which things get better when you get leaner. One is um, how you feel like you're moving around and fitting into things, like fitting into your car door, <laughs> getting in and out of your car, just taking walks, going hiking with friends, turning over in bed. Like if you're going to roll over in bed and you're pretty out of shape, if you're kind of have a lot of excess fat, like it's, it's actually just annoying. It's way more annoying. But if you lose lots of weight, you become lighter, you start to feel more free physically. And that's a big deal because I kind of am used to being very large, but also muscular. So I am burdened by my size, but also it's muscle. So it does stuff so I can do cool stuff with it when I have to. But yeah. it's, even with muscle and definitely with fat, when you lose it, you feel like you're taking a bunch of coats off. It's kind of like if you brought someone in to a normal indoor office space with 72 degree heat and you brought them and have them sit in a comfortable chair, but they're wearing like three winter coats and, and, and snow pants and boots. And you're like, yep, just make yourself at home. They're going to be like, can I take this off? And you're going to say, no, no, you're replicating a condition of being 40 pounds overweight. When you think about it, your body fat is an incredible insulator. It's better than most coats by a long shot. So you just, and it all, it's all around you, all over all of your limbs and everything. And you know, like when you finally take off like a crazy huge number of coats when it's winter time and you're a kid, you come back in, you feel so much lighter and freer. You don't want to sit in three coats. That's kind of what it ends up feeling like. That's a really, really big deal. The other perspective on that is in addition to feeling like you're more free, you actually have perceptively more energy because mm -hmm. the amount of energy it takes to move your body around is now much lower. And because you're metabolically healthier and you've been ostensibly training as well as dieting, you have more daily energy to do stuff with. You get very, very tired very quickly or aren't very motivated to do much at all if you're very over fat, but as you become leaner, you end up being like, okay, I've got energy to do this. Another thing is how you perceive yourself. That's a very big one. So if you think you are over fat and think you are unattractive, then you'll have a bit of a time in the world, especially if you're of reproductive age and you don't have a partner yet. And even if you do, um, you're going to feel a little less than, a little like you're not, um, they, I suppose the feeling is kind of like, let's say your buddy called you in 
ASAP. He's like, you get downtown ASAP, come to this restaurant. I don't care what you're doing. Shut up, come over now. And you show up in like a regular t-shirt and sweatpants. And it's like, Elon Musk is here. It just randomly is my friend. He wanted to have dinner with you. He heard you're really good. He wants to maybe give you some money for your coaching business or whatever. And you're like, on the one hand, you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. On the other hand, you're like, why do I look like this right now? Yeah. And so that kind of looking a little blah, if you're out of shape and you feel like that, that feeling follows you everywhere. I mean, you could be in a three-piece tux and go to a wedding and you haven't seen some family in a while and you're like, I look ridiculous. I look like a penguin. I hate this. I wish I was in some other body. And then I suppose lastly, though this is not an inclusive list, but it gets up there, lastly is how other people perceive you. And it's been shown time and time again in the research literature that people perceive leaner people with a bit more moral they give them a little bit more moral leeway than they do people that are uh, you know, very much out of shape. And some of that is uh, really nasty and discriminatory. Some of that is statistically valid. So people are just making stereotypes based on statistically informed decisions. Mm. But either way, people are less likely to be interested in you or impressed with you or have the best thoughts about you if you're not in um, I, not an ideal shape, but just if you're in clearly not very good shape. So it's you don't think you look good, they don't think you look good, you feel like crap, and you have lower energy than usual. If all of those reverse, all four of those things, within the context of a year of working with you, for example, when someone loses you know 30 or 40 pounds, at the end of that year, man, they're just going to have, if they're in, I think especially if they're not psychologically ready for it, they don't know what to look for, they're going to feel like it's kind of unicorn times. Everyone's nice to me. I'm more outgoing. I'm more likely to make jokes at the grocery store with people because I feel good about myself and then they feel good about me speaking to them because I don't look grotesque to them. And then I have way more energy and I feel good inside my own body. But all of a sudden, that, that seems like an effect you get from like three or four beers, but all the <laughs> time and with no inebriation or danger to your health. That, that's damn good. That's real good stuff. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I love it. The swamp ass, the self-improvement, just the the perception is really a big one that, that blows my mind because, you know, it, it plays into this thing, like you're saying, it's you know, how people perceive you and you perceive yourself. Yeah. Fuck, that's compelling. That's Very. super fucking compelling when you look in the mirror and you have thoughts about like who you are and then that's, you know, uh, just reciprocated by people in your life. Yeah. Yes. Man, more likely to be reciprocated anyway. And that kind of yeah. adds up with you if you go out and have 10 interactions today and you don't feel like you're in your best shape. So, you know, you kind of have a little frown. You kind of don't make eye contact with people because you're like, I'm just going to spare people from having to interact with my blob self. And there are some of those people aren't so nice. And they also think, like, why would I talk to this blob? And all of a sudden you have 10 interactions and maybe two of them are positive and eight are neutral and two are negative, or, or sorry, six are neutral, two are negative. And I think, okay, that's a thing. When you lose a lot of weight, you start being more upbeat, optimistic about yourself. Um, and all of a sudden, your interactions go to you know four really good interactions and only one unpleasant interaction, and the other one's a neutral. And you're like, okay, well, this is this is really much better. And that kind of exposure day to day, it really colors your perception differently. Like even if you don't know what's going on and you lose about 30 or 40 pounds, then a few weeks after you've lost that, you go to work, you go to school, you go wherever, you're just going to have an air about you that's different. You're going to have an experience memory. Like, you know, if, if, if I tell you to think back about your last, you know, vacation in some tropical climate, you may not be able to exactly remember exactly what was happening, exactly what you, but there's kind of like aura around it. Like, oh, this is really, really good times. But that's what it's going to feel like looking back on the last few weeks of a fat loss phase being done. I just, everything just seems, I don't know, man, it just seems better. And there are very distinct reasons just covered for that, but it will sneak up on you if you don't know any better. And the, the plus side is um, it's an amazing feeling and everyone should have a chance to experience it. The tiny little downside, I just have to say for being intellectually complete, is that some people who get a whole lot of that kind of vibe but don't know how it breaks down and don't know how to get it for others, they'll go hook, line, and sinker into like, um, what's that called? Um, Ponzi scheme, pyramid scheme, fitness stuff, where they'll be like, it's changed my life top to bottom. I'm a totally new person. And you're like, <laughs> I just think you're really high off of people thinking you look good and you feel good and look good. Maybe it's not as important or impactful or as over the top as you would say, but it sure as shit can feel like that. You know, it's like asking a kid what he thinks. 
20 minutes after getting into amusement park. You know, they're like, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. You're like, that's not true, but yeah, I see you're having fun. Mm -hmm. So we, we should as adults seek to be like, okay, I understand that this feeling definitely takes me somewhere. It doesn't take me everywhere. There are limitations to what I can get out of fitness, but it's very nice to recognize like not only yes, am I experiencing these great feelings, but also if I'm a coach or if I'm someone who wants to lose more weight, I can remember that more of these kinds of feelings are probably headed my way if I'm successful. Yeah. Hundred percent. It's like the alleviation of of kind of the the boo side of things, and and then the accumulation of all the yay side of things. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. I I definitely had that honeymoon phase when I first you know, dropped a bunch of weight, and uh, I've seen that across the board. It's it's bizarre and it's really cool. But it's I love to hear cool. your perspective on it. That's awesome. The next thing I wanted to kind of hear your input on was. I know RP came out with, you know, some simplified workout and, and nutrition templates, but I'm curious from your perspective, if someone were to say, Hey, I'm looking to give the least amount that I can, this is a terrible attitude to go into this type yes. of stuff, but Hey, <laughs> I, you know, like I, if I were to just give what I had, uh, you know, short arms and deep pockets with my fitness efforts, you know, what, what would be the things that I would focus on? Is it daily activity? Is it really just dipping into the nutrition side of things? Or should I be making lifestyle interventions to get stuff moving in the right direction? How would you encourage someone to get started if they, if they had a limited desire or bandwidth for it? Yeah. Because I know enough about sports science to know what actually has the best effects for the least amount of time. I could just recommend an actual literal thing for people to do, but uh, I, can, I can explain thereafter why it's the best use of time. It's not something maybe people would intuitively come to, but people who want the sort of the lowest hanging fruit, probably best to do, best, best off to do two things at the same time, just two. One is train with weights twice a week nice. for 30 to 45 minutes at a time for beginners doing whole body training with minimum rest breaks. You can actually get an unbelievable amount of muscle gain from that, a huge amount of metabolic throughput. And there's enough resistance training to do for at least a year, possibly in perpetuity, to get what many people would consider more than enough muscle on their body. Because most people don't want to be jacked. They want to like get leaner and underneath isn't some like Willem Dafoe starving skeleton character, no offense, Willem Dafoe, but someone who, you know, a little bit more like Chris Evans, you know, Captain America, just a little bit like that. Two times so, a week. That's two awesome. times a week, two times a week. That's all you need. And they're really like, people really have a poor understanding of this intuitively because they usually compare themselves to pro bodybuilders and other crazy athletes. Well, you know, The Rock trains six times a week. Yeah, that's why he looks like The Rock. You're trying to look like The Rock? You you, you think that a bare minimum effort is going to get you to look like The Rock? They're, they're going to be like, well, no, of course not. We're like, right on. Well, so don't worry about it. Two times a week is a really great start and great continu continuation if you just don't want to go any further than that. But what that does is that kind of like, it really puts the um, the turnover on muscle tissue really well. So it grows your muscle, it breaks it down, boosts the metabolism, mm. and then doing nothing else. All you need to do is check your nutrition for the whole week, mm. train twice every week with weights. And really you're there as far as putting in the two things that are going to make big notable changes. I'm not saying it's the optimal program, but it'll get the ball moving in a big way because it's, it's almost like, uh, I guess the analogy here is like, if you type in the GPS coordinates for the exact restaurant in Los Angeles you want to go if you're driving there from Las Vegas. Yes, it'll take you there. But if you just like drop a pin to city center LA, like for at least the first, you know, two hours of your drive, you're going in the right direction. Like nobody has to be like, well, you really should update that restaurant. So stay on the other end of LA. Yeah, and we'll get there. We'll change it. So it's kind of like if you're doing two workouts, 30 to 45 minutes long each week, and you're eating in a way that is sensible, I can describe exactly what that means in a second, um, then man, myself, at least as a professor of exercise and sports science, if I looked at your plan, if we sat down next to each other on a plane and you told me what your plan was, look, 
I cleaned up my diet and I'm, I'm lifting weights twice a week. That's all I got time for. I'd be like, dude, you are so well on your way. Don't you let anyone stop you. You're absolutely doing. It's like, if we're building a car, you got a steering wheel, you got an engine, you got a frame and you got wheels. You're going, you're going, you're in that car works. And that's, it doesn't have air conditioning. It doesn't have padded seats, but gee whiz, you know, you're, you're well on your way. So what I need really quick about cleaning up the diet or nutrition, I'm say, oh, an oddly austere term, and like cleaning up, Jesus, what, what does that even mean? It really means either all or the preponderance of your food should be healthy food. And that's actually also not confusing. Most, most people will pretend like that confuses them and they're just shooting a ship because they don't want to avoid having to eat the, stop eating the foods they know are unhealthy. But really there's a list. It's uh, f- veggies, fruits, whole grains, lean meats, and healthy fats. And you can Google these things. They're so easy to find. We've got a crap load of products at RP and whole books to describe what those are. We've got a crazy ton of videos on RP about how to pick foods. What is a healthy food? It really is just those food categories. And you look at something you're eating. Is it a veggie? Is it a fruit? Is it a whole grain? Is it a relatively lean protein source? Uh, or is it a healthy fat? Like, is it like nuts, nut butters, olive oil, canola oil? Or is it like you know, bacon grease or something. If you stick almost exclusively to those healthy foods, the probability that you're going to overeat is very, very small. And so you don't even have to cut calories, just start eating healthier. Most people will lose, especially if it's the person we're talking about. It's kind of over fat. Um, how do I say this without exaggerating, but without underselling the point, almost nobody gets fat and stays fat eating mostly healthy food. It's just almost never happens. Bodybuilders try to gain weight eating mostly or only healthy food, and it's the toughest thing in the world. That's just really annoying. But if you just say, okay, no more junk food, at least for the next 12 weeks, you're going to be losing pounds and pounds of fat a week in most cases, and that'll really transform you. So I would say those two things alone, weights twice a week, eat mostly or only healthy foods, and gee whiz, like you're, you're really onto it. That's rock star. I love that, man. It's super simple. The, uh, the, the quotable one in there is just almost nobody gets over fat and stays there eating primarily healthy food. That's, that's a banger. I love that. Yeah. One, one thing that, that I was curious about is you did mention that, Hey, you know, you probably don't want to be a pro bodybuilder. You know, you don't need to train six days a week to get some kind of results in the gym, but something, uh, this may just be my personal bias, but something I've noticed, uh, after incorporating some more bodybuilding style training principles found, man, things feel good. I feel <laughs> like I feel lubed up. This is coming from a beat up too much power lifting, too much mm. intensity, too much frequency, but damn, does bodybuilding training ever just feel fucking good? Yeah. It's hard and it, it's, it makes you sore and it's, it hurts in the moment. But as far as like my joints and connective tissue, Oh yeah. Damn. Like, and, and for someone just getting into this stuff, nothing crazy explosive going on, everything controlled, nothing like wildly athletic or demanding of like crazy coordination. It seems like a pretty good entry point, that style of training uh, for someone who's kind of just getting into things, which might sound a little crazy. Some people, they think bodybuilding, they think, oh my God, this Mike guy's arms are so fucking big. He needs to get a wider chair to even sit in. Yeah, it's a problem. But, yeah, do you think there's something that like just average gym goer kind of guy getting into it and wanting to see some changes could learn from maybe a bodybuilding style approach? So bodybuilding technically is a sport hmm. in which you compete in minimal clothing through going through poses and compared to other people. What happens under the hood with bodybuilding is something called hypertrophy training, which is a training to maximize or maintain muscle growth. And that style of training is also the style of training that almost all quote unquote gen pop people need to be using. So this comes back to kind of why, what are we doing in the gym? Why are people in the gym? When people start training and they're just sort of regular folks and they want to be able to go to the gym, they're not going to the gym for some mysterious reason. They're going to the gym because there's an outcome variable or set of variables they're looking to improve. Mm. One of the big ones is health. One of the big ones is strength, but the biggest one by far is body composition. People want that better shape. I mean, then they're training for hypertrophy, very similar to how bodybuilder would. They just don't train as much maybe, but bodybuilding style training 
is amazing because it gives people directly the results they want, mm. but also because of the way we do it at RP with controlled eccentrics, with pauses, with deep stretches, with very, very, very good technique, that kind of thing ends up being amazing for your joints and amazing for your full body function. I mean, people ask us all the time if we do mobility training, what we say is like, if you can do stiff like at Ellis good mornings and you can do flexion rows and you can do full range of motion dips and pull-ups and squats, you, that is mobility training. We are mobile through the entire range of motion of the joint. We're strong through the whole range of motion. That is the definition of mobility is strength multiplied by flexibility. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you've checked that box in a huge, huge way. So when we're training through a full range of motion with control, all of a sudden that checks the boxes of hypertrophy, but it also checks the boxes of supporting human movement and, and bodily health really, 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 really well. And in a sense, it's probably the best way to train for full body movement and health because you want to be able to hit strange positions at the end of your range of motion and be strong in them in order to ensure the fact that you are capable there and don't get hurt there. But that also that deep stretch functions as kind of a rehab situation mm. for you and it makes everything feel great. It's kind of therapy at the same time as training. And it also checks the box of getting you all that hypertrophy that you wanted, which is why you're in the gym to begin with is to get the sexy body of your dreams. So hypertrophy training, I don't like to encourage people to look at it as this like very exotic thing that only bodybuilders do. Uh, and a lot of times really it's what almost everyone should be doing. And there's so many terms in the fitness industry and the exercise science uh, field and profession about what it is that we call the thing, the lifting that beginners do. And there's a lot of terms that just don't, they just don't make sense. So first one is weightlifting and that's wrong because weightlifting is one word. It's a sport in the Olympics. So snatch and the clean and jerk. That's the only thing weightlifting is. There's another term called resistance training, which isn't wrong, but it's very general, you know, strength training, power training, ballistic training, uh, that's all resistance training. So it's hypertrophy training. Mm -hmm. So, okay, great. Then a lot of times people will say strength training and you'll see this, this used very, very highly in uh, muscle magazines and women's health magazines, like the benefits of strength training. And then you look at the pictures of the girl doing this stuff and you look at the repetition ranges and you look at what they're talking about as the outcome. And they're like, this is bodybuilding training. This is physique sculpting training. Nobody's doing any strength training. There's no th three sets of three here. There's five by eight to 12. And they're like, like, make sure you hit your glute meat ladies. Like that's that strength strength program is doing that. So you realize that at the end of the day, most beginners really just want, well, hypertrophy training. And the great thing about hypertrophy training, especially in sets of five to 10 reps roughly is when you're in that hypertrophy training rep range and zone, you end up having a situation where you're checking the boxes of muscle growth. You're absolutely checking the boxes of strength improvement because like, look, sets of five to 10 reps for a few months, a few years, you're going to get way stronger and build a ton of muscle. And it checks off the boxes of mobility and health and all that good stuff. So it turns out like limited, or, or I would say, however much hypertrophy training you're able to recover from and interested in doing in a week, hypertrophy training is probably the best entry point into resistance training for gen pop folks for pretty much everyone that comes to see you unless they have exotic goals of like you know i want to be a shot putter or something and you're like well okay <laughs> different yeah. stuff but for most people who want to be strong and healthy and you know the 90 percent of it they leave out which is look good in clothes and naked then yeah hypertrophy training is the way to do them and be and it's not bodybuilding training because bodybuilding is training to get a speedo on you and go step on stage and flex your muscles. Hypertrophy training is used by both regular people and by power lifters and by bodybuilders. But the regular folks who use general hypertrophy training, they're going to find that it's giving them pretty close to the best combination of results that they're into. Mateo, you are on mute. Oh, thank God we have an expert here. <laughs> you know, that is incredible. I wasn't expecting you to say it as definitively as you did. Hey, look, this is a, like maybe the best place that people could start. And that's really cool. And I really love the first mobility section where you talk about it. I think I heard maybe Alberto Nunez or someone just say like, look, this is loaded stretching. Like, yes. When, when you're going and doing deep squats, like what else is that? But just you're loading into deep places. And it sounds like the principles you really highlighted that make this so, you know, agreeable for most people is controlled movement. Yep. Deep range of motion. Yep. Moderate 
loading ranges, if we can call it that, like not doing. Yes. So, so what I would say is, and there's a lot of reasons that beginners, I, I believe, should start with sets of five to ten reps. But just real quickly, a few of them. It's enough reps to learn stuff, but not so many that you get exhausted. But like you try to teach someone who's doing a 15 rep set after rep 10, they're just so tired and so annoyed with the pain. They're not really learning anything. Yeah. And then they're just going to practice really poorly. If you do try to do sets of under five reps, the, the reps are so heavy that folks can screw up the technique. And not only is it a little bit dangerous, but also it's just like, well, I guess it's too heavy for you to really do it right. It's like if someone was teaching you like a drill to do with like raising a weapon and shooting at the enemy, but it was like, okay, so the simulation here is like Fallujah 2003. You're like, as soon as I step out, I'm going to die. Like, well, yeah, it's tough. It's the real world. Like that's too tough to learn with. Let's yeah. just scale this back a little bit. So for that reason, sets of five to 10 are great, but also sets of five to 10 are right at that uh, rep range where you get lots of strength enhancement for people that haven't trained before and a meat and potatoes of hypertrophy enhancement. So from that full range of motion training for sets of five to 10, not only is it an amazing thing for beginners to do, but it's this um, real cornucopia of benefits that hits you all over. It's it's kind of like um, getting a, maybe like a supercharged um, station wagon, uh, like a supercharged Volvo station wagon as a car. Like if it's you haven't had a car before, it's not the most comfortable car in the world, but it's really nice. It's not the fastest, but it's got a supercharger and it's not a minivan, but it'll ferry your kids and, and your dogs around because it's a station wagon. It's kind of like just a real, it's just bad. It, like if that's the rental car you pick up at the rental place when you're going, you didn't ask for it. You're not going to be pissed. You're going to be like, this is a great, useful car. Now, if I want to become a power lifter, I get, you know, a Dodge Hemi truck. If I want to become a bodybuilder, I, I, I get a Mustang GT with 10 cylinders, blah, blah, blah. But that's all exotic stuff you can always go for. It's just a, a supercharged Volvo station wagon. It's just so goddamn good at everything. And it's not amazing at anything, but it's just such the right answer. And you get a little bit of a taste of everything you want. Because like, that's your first car and you really like the supercharger. Look, next car is going to be a faster car. So if you try some hypertrophy training with sets of five to 10 and you just fall in love with it, well, then look, like, then it's five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, modern periodization, team full ROM, all that crazy body mode stuff. Welcome. But you can stay in that five to 10 rep range and learn great lifting techniques and then realize, you know, I like closer to sets of five. Can I do three to six and do strength? Well, and you're unbelievably well prepared. Just a tiny little reduction in reps, tiny little increase in load, and you're already there. It's such an awesome general thing. It, it's almost like kind of like a ghetto CrossFit, uh, like a more general CrossFit, even than CrossFit that we're promoting. Full range of motion through the compound heavy lift, sets of five to 10. It'll get you movement competency. It'll prep you for strength. It'll prep you for hypertrophy. It's kind of that, again, that Volvo. I don't even know if that's a real car. I'm sure it's, there's some kind of car for it. Volvo station wagon GT supercharged. It's just good. And anywhere you want to step off to your next car is great, but it'll get you a lot of real upsides to where you're doing a lot of stuff. And a lot of people who get into fitness they just want to be better, right? Like imagine giving a 16 year old a car to be like, well, it's going to have to be a Volvo GT station wagon. They're like, Jesus, yes, thank God. Absolutely. Yes, it's a car and it works. And it's GT. Holy, I mean, the station wagon I don't love, but hey, I got a lot of high friends I put in the back and they don't have to drive. So it's, it's just a lot of right answers at first. And because it's so many right answers, if you want to really sp specialize later, that's such a great place to specialize from. It's mm -hmm. safe. It's effective. It gives you a kind of a taste of all the results that you're going to get. And then if you ever like really want to go extreme hypertrophy or extreme strength or extreme power, or just go into some kind of all sport altogether, you start doing calisthenics for sport. That's totally cool, but nothing beats that base of starting with sets of five to 10 full range, eccentric control, good technique, compound, heavy movements. Damn dude, that's practice. That's very nice. I love that. That is just awesome, man. The shotgun approach gets everything. Uh, without uh, giving you too much of the things you don't want. Amazing. Uh, last thing I'll quickly ask you before I set you free here. Um, one time I watched a video that you had about um, getting motivated to lose fat through dieting. And one of the most interesting sections I had thought about was the inspiration section, where you talked about inspiration as the spark that starts you on this stuff. I'd love to hear, um, or maybe some folks who might be watching this might benefit from hearing just one way that you think people can get inspired uh to, to start yeah inspiration's interesting when i reached the part of my academic career intellectual career where i started to look into it the reason i looked into it was 
I was tasked with teaching um, an exercise behavior course when I was a professor at another university. And it's kind of like, like, why do people behave a certain way towards exercise? What are the ways we get them to stick to it more? What are the stumbling blocks? The problem with this course is that though it was a modern course, um, it had a bunch of different theoretical approaches in it, and none of them were unified. There was not one grand unified approach. A trans theoretical model came the closest, but it had a bunch of big holes. It's, it's something like a theory of planned behavior. It's not a theory at all. It's at best a model, maybe just a hypothesis. I was like, ah, this is real crap. So I had to redo all that stuff myself and kind of re-architect the theory. And uh, where I came to is I had a couple of different uh, there's a couple of different distinct things going on, like inspiration, motivation, intention, discipline, habit, et cetera. These are all distinct concepts, but they all occurred on a timeline. So they were linearly escalating, which is really convenient. But the problem was a lot of people had misunderstood some concepts to be some others, uh, and they didn't understand the framework. So they would say like, you know, the number one thing in getting your goals done is discipline. It's like, well, actually, if you look at it, discipline is only the thing that like it's your non-system, it's your reserve battery. You can't just run it all the time. Yeah, if you have a ball or reserve battery, it's much better than not having one. So any day in which you're totally in the dumps, you just totally have no idea, you know, why hell you're even doing this. Willpower can be like, hey, just shut up and get through it. Great, but you can't do that for five days. You can't do that for 10 days on end. So you have to realize there's all this other stuff going on and it's up to you or up to your coach to arrange these things in such a way that you kind of hop from lily pad to lily pad on solid ground and then get across the kind of lake sized chasm of you're not meeting your goals yet. And the first lily pad is inspiration. And uh, really, it's actually the first, the, the left bank of the lake, not even a lily pad yet. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a reason to jump across all the lily pads to get to the other side. Inspiration's that reason. And so there's a very decent argument that. You actually will not accomplish any result unless you're sufficiently inspired, kind of by definition, to do something about it, to change your ways. Because if you change your ways, there is some decent argument that you had to, by definition, have become inspired to do so. Even if that inspiration was like, dad, fuck it, why not change my body? Good enough, right? But it could have been something more profound. And it's usually something more profound, especially with folks that have been pretty out of shape. Folks that have been, you know, dare I say, I suppose politely ignoring the problem. And I don't mean like some, some kind of sociological problem, fat people need to lose weight. I love you one way or the other. I don't give a fuck. But they didn't like their bodies for a long time, maybe weeks, maybe months, maybe years. And it's been bubbling up. And then inspiration, not always, but often comes from a stark realization of no more. I can't do this anymore. And a lot of times, uh, one of the examples I bring up when I lecture about this is you go to work and you work on the sixth floor and your elevator takes you there and you're working computers. So you just sit in your car, you stand in the elevator, you sit at your desk, you stand in the elevator, you sit in your car and you're back home or you sit on the couch. No big deal. There's just no opportunity for you to really have to test your physical fitness. One day, Company's upgrading the elevator and the elevator's broken for two hours. It just happens to be when you showed up to work. And they're like, well, look, there's the stairs and it's a nice staircase. You know, one of those really broad ones where the steps are really small and it's just all the time in the world to climb. And by the time you're on the fourth floor, there's coworkers passing you because you're like, <gasps> and it's fucking embarrassing. And you get to your desk and you're still panting, you're sweating, and you're like, you know what? Nope. Nope, 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 nope. I am inspired to change this. Now, how long is that feeling going to last? Mm -hmm. Might last long enough for you to go to Mateo Mara's Instagram and book him for coaching, <laughs> but it might not. And so a lot of times inspiration is this like little firework that goes off that mm, nobody called, nobody answered, then it goes away. It's a fleeting groundswell of emotion. But sometimes the groundswell is so high that it compels you to do something. And sometimes that's awesome to get you started. Now, as soon as you get started, inspiration is no longer the thing. And that's why people get it twisted again, is they'll think, okay, I, I need my Instagram feed full of inspiring stories. Well, hold on a second. Once, I, once you're kicked into your process, you need a goal and you need to, to aim towards something. What inspired me to go hiking was that I need to get in shape. What motivates me to finish is I know the hike is two miles long and there's little waypoints at every quarter mile to tell me I'm almost there. It's the goal that I need now. And that's something that I need help with, but that has to occur as inspiration first, 
Motivation, which is always and everywhere goal-based, second. Why? Imagine having a goal without inspiration. Try to imagine it. Be like, all right, you want to get in shape? Why? Like, yeah, don't you feel like you need to get in shape? Like, no, I sure don't. Like, do you feel inspired to run a marathon? I sure shit don't. So if someone's like, how is your motivation to run a marathon? I'd be like, literally zero. And they're like, why? What's wrong? I'm like, nothing. It just hasn't have been inspired to do it. So all of these inspiration, motivation, habits, that's another one we could beat to death. I got to go in just a bit, but like habits are so huge. People talk about motivation. Motivation is so much easier when you have habits ingrained. So all of these things, motivation, habits, inspiration, et cetera, they have to come in a sequence. And if you're going to do the thing right, you got to check each box off in a line. And that first box is inspiration. So just to bring it out to the real world, one of the most, in a sense, difficult questions that I'll ever get is, and this is a question I'm sure you've gotten before, like, hey, and they'll usually use the term motivation. They're using it wrong. No big deal. I'm not a pedantic idiot like that. What they mean is inspiration, right? But I'll say it how most people do. They'll say, hey, just getting real, it's real tough to get motivated to go to the gym and eat well. What, what words of wisdom do you have for me? What they mean is inspired. Uh, no, that's okay. Same, same, right? I don't know, Mateo. What do you tell people about that? Inspiration's got to come from within. Yeah. It's like watching a kid get beat up by bullies coming up to him and be like, you want to take like karate classes? He's like, nah. You're like, what the fuck more can I offer you here, kid? Is this, you like this? They're like, I don't mind it. Like, okay, well then very well. You're never going to go self-defense because if this isn't what's doing it for you, it's not going to do it. So a lot of times I'm least, I feel least competent, least powerful to help people when they go like, hey, like I need motivation or slash inspiration. <laughs> Yeah. You came to the wrong place. That's got to come from within, at least at some level. Now, if I talk to you a little while, if I ask you about stuff, if I ask you about your goals, can we, can we like play the world's smallest harp and the little music notes turn into inspiration? Maybe, but is that something I'm willing to guarantee? No way, man. Which is one of the things that RP that we say, like, you ready to come to get in shape, we'll get you there. If you're not ready, I, I, I would love to help you, but I can't, I can't do it for you. I can't do it against your will. Does that make sense? 100%. You got to have that origin story, whether it's a negative start or an aspirational one. Yes. Yeah. There's got to be that, that origin. I love it, man. Dude, I appreciate you being here. This has been absolutely awesome. I think a lot of people are going to learn a lot from it. Awesome. Let me know when this comes out. I'll share the crap out of it. All right. Thanks so much, Mike. Have an awesome day, man. Of course. I got to run Mateo. Take care. Hopefully you learned something from that conversation. Thanks for watching it. Don't forget to do all the awesome stuff like like this video, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more stuff like this, and let me know in a comment below who I should have on the show next time. And if I'm going to ask the experts something, what is it that you want to learn about most? Again, thanks so much for being here. My name is Mateo, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.